Will you pray with me? Loving God and Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the disciples, that they were smart enough to ask, Lord, teach us to pray. So this morning we ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Help us to understand what it is that you require of us, and help us to do it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you'd like to follow along, we're uh, looking in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're doing a series of sermons this summer on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, <clears throat> the congregation was praying the pastoral prayer along with the pastor, and then they went into the Lord's Prayer. They were praying together the Lord's Prayer, and they came to the petition, lead us not into temptation. And one of the profligate members of the congregation was overheard to mumble very loudly, I can find my own way there, thank you very much. Lead us not into temptation uh, is what we're going to look at this morning. And I think it's a little bit more nuanced and it means a little bit more than perhaps we might have thought that it means. Um, so we'll get there in just a moment. In the summer of 1986, Cheryl and I got married and we went on our honeymoon and we came home from our honeymoon and we gave two weeks notice at our jobs and we packed up our meager earthly treasures and we moved to Chesapeake, Virginia where I could begin my vocational ministry on staff with Young Life. One of the highlights of getting to Chesapeake was uh, the, the corridor group, the other uh, pastors or the other Young Life area directors who were in that area. Scott was in Virginia Beach and Joey in Norfolk and uh, Charlie up in Williamsburg. And every month we would meet somewhere, usually in Norfolk or Chesapeake because that was more central, for fellowship and for accountability and for prayer for and with one another. And we really got to know each other and our families got to know each other really well. And it was a real gift. Among my three friends, the one that I connected with the most was Charlie. He was a lot like me. Uh, we both liked Jimmy Buffett, uh, the other two guys not so much. Um, Charlie uh, had these pithy sayings that he picked up along the way, and I admired him, so I would steal those from him, and I would use them. Uh, one that I remember is that, um, now this is dealing with temptation. Um, I want to do it, but Jesus doesn't, and Christ is in me and I am in Christ, so I'm not going to do it. Um, or it goes the other way, too. I don't want to share my faith with this person, but Christ is in me, and I am in Christ, and Christ wants to do it, so I'll do it. I mean, this is 35 years later, and he's still kind of in my head a little bit. Um, as time passed, we kind of moved on and we went our separate ways. Charlie became a pastor in Bermuda, First Baptist Church of Devonshire, Bermuda. And uh, I was the pastor in uh, a church in York, Pennsylvania. Um, but we'd get together periodically. Uh, one of our friends has a retreat that he would put on, usually in the spring. And we'd get together, Scott and um, Charlie and I, we'd, we'd go to this retreat and get caught up and hang out together. Unbeknownst to me, his last couple of years in Bermuda were very difficult. And uh, he left his church bitter and wounded. And in the midst of that, his marriage also was not going very well. He moved back to the States and he took a, a secular job and then he was surrounded by people that didn't share his values, that didn't share his commitment to Christ and to the Christian faith. And uh, he began to get dragged down by them. And um, he went to a class reunion and he left his wife for uh, a girl he'd known in high school uh, 20 years plus of marriage out the window calling on his life out the window his career or his ministry gone a comfortable intimacy with family forever shattered because he has left his wife the wife of his youth for this person that he had gone to high school with and why do i tell you this cautionary tale because Paul says that take heed, lest you think you're something and discover that you are nothing. Think soberly of yourselves so as to have sound judgment. But for the grace of God, there goes any one of us. It is the human condition. We are all subject to trials and temptations. And as we just sang, and do we take these things to the Lord in prayer? Are we intentional about it? Are we conscious about it? Or 
do we stop reading our Bibles and we stop praying and we stop participating in church and in the fellowship and the things that encouraged us and built us up, they become strangers to us and we find ourselves just kind of drifting away from Jesus and drifting away from the faith. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man or to humanity. It's the human condition. This is the world that we live in. We all face trials and temptations. So Jesus understanding that, see, because it says in Hebrews, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in every way that we have been tempted, but he was without sin, yet without sin, he gets it. And so his disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he says in verse 9, and when you pray, pray like this. And then we get down to, and lead us not into temptation. He understands that we are subject to the vicissitudes of life, to our desires, to our flesh. And so he wants us, in terms of spiritual warfare, to arm ourselves. Lead us not into temptation, is what he tells his disciples to pray. Now, that petition is more nuanced, I think, than you might understand or, or be aware of. So you, you need to understand Jesus spoke Aramaic, and Aramaic is a kissing cousin to Hebrew, and then our New Testament's written in Greek. And so the word in Aramaic or Hebrew is different than the word in Greek, but the Greek word in your New Testament is parazane. Parazane is used 21 times in the New Testament, 20 of those times, it doesn't mean temptation, it means trial or test. And it carries a passive uh, sense to it, not just uh, uh, an active lead us not into. It can also be translated, particularly in the Aramaic that Jesus spoke, let us not be led into temptation. Temptation in this verse, here's the mental picture, it's a place, the house of temptation. Most of you are old enough to remember the house of the song, the house of the rising sun. Many a poor boy got wrecked in the house of the rising sun. This is the picture Jesus is painting for us. Don't let me be led into the house of temptation. Lord, keep me out of there. Don't let me get dragged in there because I may not be able to stand up against all of those temptations. So Jesus is encouraging his disciples to pray that way. It means both temptation. If you'll turn with me to the New Testament lesson, it's James chapter 1. That's um, 10, 11, if you're using the Pew Bible. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. There's the word, same word, parazane, not temptation. Remains steadfast under trial. But down to verse 13, it says, um, let no one say when he is tempted. Same word. There's a nuance, and it's determined in the Greek by the context. It can mean trial. It can mean test. It can mean temptation. To our modern ears, we hear the word temptation, and it only means one thing. It's to be... Um, seduced into doing what we know is wrong. It's to be seduced into sin. Um, and it can't mean that because we're praying to our Heavenly Father. Lead us not into temptation. In James, right here again, let not any one of you say that when you are tempted that it is God who is tempting me. Because that's not who God is and that's not what God does. However, He does test us. He does give us trials. And what are they for? It's a spiritual workout. It's like going to the gym. I don't like necessarily to go to the gym. Every time I do, I'm glad I went. But it's a chore. It's a, it's a trial to get me to go there. And what do you do? I'm pushing these weights around, doing nothing with them. I'm pushing these weights. Around. And then I get on the elliptical, and I do three miles on the elliptical. I do some cardio. And... I feel better when I do that. I sleep better when I do that. So I know it's good for me and I know I should do it. But who really wants to go there and do all of that? Well, that's, that's, we, God wants us to be spiritual athletes. So he sends to us, not a gym membership, but trials and tests. Um, 
Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. You know the story. God comes to uh, Abraham and he says, uh, I want you to sacrifice your only son, Isaac. I want to know if I'm the most important thing in your life or whether you've made an idol of your son. And in the King James Version, it says, and it came to pass that God tempted Abraham. Again, God doesn't tempt someone to lust. He doesn't tempt someone to sin. It's a test. It's a trial. And it can be the same thing for us. So imagine somebody who has a potty mouth. And they use their golf words at all kinds of inopportune times. And they decide, I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to uh, change my vocabulary. And so the day after they make that decision, there they go down to the traffic circle where all the sin in Pinehurst happens. And they're trying to get into the traffic circle and somebody cuts them off. And that's a temptation for them to use their golf words and shake their hand out the window at that person. However, if it's two years later and if they've made steady progress in changing their vocabulary, then it's not a temptation, it's a test. Are you going to continue your resolve? Are you going to continue to the commitment that you made to changing your language? And it's a test. And that's what God sends our way. Not to get us to sin, not to make us fail or to cause us to fail. Now, we do that. And Jesus knows it because in the Lord's Prayer back in Matthew, he says in verse um, 12, and forgive us our debts, our trespasses, our sins. We don't always do what we know is the right thing to do. We don't always do our best. Again, that's part of the human condition. But he sends these things to us so that we can become better men and women. He sends these things to us so that we can be stronger in our resolve and stronger in our faith. God bless the Pope. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Pope's in a heap of trouble right now. Um, he wants to change the words in the Lord's Prayer. What? Now, uh, he, he, and here's why he wants to do it. But well, let me first tell you what he wants to do. So we're looking at lead us not into temptation. Uh, he wants to change it to, now you, I've explained to you about the, the, the noun, temptation, test, trial. It can mean all of those. Instead of lead us not into temptation, he wants to change it to do not abandon us in the time of trial. Do not abandon us in the time. That is completely legitimate. That is totally a reasonable translation of this verse. It's the passive part. Do not let us be led. Do not abandon us in the time of trial. And why does he care about that? Because the Pope Imagine a pastor getting in trouble for this. The Pope wants to be more biblical. He's in trouble because he wants to be more biblical. It says in James, God doesn't tempt anyone. But when we pray, lead us not into temptation, in the popular mind, it's God who is leading us into temptation. Hallowed be thy name. He cares about God's glory. He cares about God's reputation. And he wants us to understand that God isn't tempting us to sin. God is not the siren song calling us to do all manner of evil and terrible things. So he wants to change it. Back to Matthew. So in Matthew, Jesus says, his disciples, teach us how to pray. And he says, and when you pray, pray these words in this order and don't change any of them. And when you pray, say this magical incantation. That's not what the Lord's prayer is. That's not what he said. Look at verse 9. When you pray, pray like this. Use this as a model. This is an outline. Pray about these kinds of things. Pray for forgiveness. Pray about your temptations and your trials and your difficulties. He doesn't say pray these words. It's totally fine to pray the Lord's Prayer and not use any of these words. To change it around and riff off of it. Jesus wants us to do that. He says, when you pray, go into your inner room, your secret room, and your father who sees, who hears in secret, he will reward you. He wants you to go in there, and he wants you to be transparent. And he wants you to be real. And he wants you to unburden yourself. So if you're facing a temptation, or if you're facing a trial, he wants to meet you in your prayer closet, in your secret room, and he wants you to talk to him as as you talk to anybody else. 
There's no religious vocabulary. Again, it's not a magical incantation. God bless the Pope. He's in trouble by his flock for just trying to do what Jesus is telling us we as the people of God ought to be doing. Um, Back to uh, James chapter 1. I'm sorry to keep flipping you back and forth between the two. These may be the first two verses I ever learned in the, in the Bible, uh, memorizing scripture. My best friend Jeff Sloan calls these the love pain verses. Whack, whack, oh quit it some more, it hurts so good, love pain. Chapter 1 verses 2 through 4, um, and it's, it'll deviate from yours because I didn't memorize it in the extra special version. Um, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result, that you might be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So when you experience hardship and trials and tests, we are to consider it all joy. They don't feel like that. We don't experience them that way. And in the King James, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. In the King James, that's worded, consider it all joy when you have divers temptations. Again, that's a legitimate translation. It's, it's a nuance of that noun, parazane, um, and, and, and that's fine. Um, but he wants us to understand Jesus does, because he's speaking to his disciples in Aramaic. And so we, we, in the translation from Aramaic to Greek to English, we, we lose some of the nuance. We lose some of the understanding of what it is that Jesus is telling his disciples to pray. So he's telling them to pray these things. And so lead us not into the house of the rising sun, into temptation. Where does temptation come from? See, we... Or if we're forewarned, we're forearmed. And so where does that come from? Some temptation comes to us from outside of ourselves. My friend Charlie, he got in with a group of guys that just didn't value the things of the kingdom of God, and he, he fell into sin and left his family, and um, it, it, peer pressure, it comes to us from outside. Paul says in... Um, Romans 12, and I love it in the modern English version of J.B. Phillips. Don't let the world press you into its mold. The world is constantly trying to conform us to the values of the world we live in. Every commercial you see on TV, everyone you hear on the radio, all of that is trying to press you into a mold. Luther said we are to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is after us, and it wants us to look like everybody else and value the same things that they value, which are not the things that God values. So the flesh, the world, so first the world. John says in 1 John 2.15, what is that? The world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. That's what our economy is built on. Covetousness. Oh, they changed the chrome on this year's Ford. I got to get a new Ford because the chrome is different than last year. There's nothing wrong with your car. Oh, but they put a fin on the 57 Chevy, so I got to get rid of my 56 because I want the car with a fin on it. And we're letting the world press us into its mold. The world, the flesh. We are to make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts, says Paul. The flesh is, we've got a new nature, we've been a new, we're a new creature, we've been born again, we're not what we used to be, and yet the old man, the first Adam, still lives within us. Paul says in Romans 7, the thing I want to do, ah, bummer, I can't do it, and the thing I hate, the sin, the stuff I don't want to do, that's what I find myself running to. Who will deliver me from this mess? Chapter 8, Jesus does. But that's why we pray. Jesus understands the psychology of this temptation, and he's telling his disciples, you're going to experience these things, the highs and the lows and trials and temptations. So pray, lead us not into temptation. Chuck Swindoll uses this illustration. There was a test done in the 60s, uh, and it was kind of a psychological test, and they did it on little kids. Shame on them. 
for making them guinea pigs. And so from kids from elementary school all the way through high school, and the experiment was this. They had three cards that they would hold up, and so they had three volunteers to hold the cards up in different order, and it just one had a little dash on it, one had a, a line, and then one had a really long line. And they told the kids, when, you, when they hold up the cards, then you point at the longest line. Well, unbeknownst to the sucker, one kid in a group of 10, the other nine were always told, point at the medium-sized line every time. And so they hold up the cards, and nine kids point at the medium-sized line, and every time the kid would frown, and he'd look at them, and he'd look at the lines, and he'd look at them, and then he'd point at the same one they pointed at. Didn't matter if they were eight or 18, 75% of the time, he would point at the one he knew was wrong. Why? Because of the crowd. Newspaper interviewed a woman who was 102 years old at her birthday party at the home. And the reporter asked her, so what's the best part of turning the century mark? And with a twinkle in her eye and a smile, she said, no peer pressure. <laughs> They're all gone. Got nothing to worry about. Temptation comes to us from outside of ourselves, from those who want to lead us astray, but they also come to us, sadly, from those that love us or, uh, and, and want what's best for us, in their own mind, what's best for us. Uh, a kid may decide that he's got a call to the priesthood. Well, mom is not having any of that. You're not going to have any grandbabies. We're not having any priests and going into the priesthood business. Forget that. Get that out of your head. You need to wake up. You need to straighten up and fly right. Little girl decides she wants to go to Africa as a missionary, but they've got the Ebola virus in Africa, and there's civil war in Africa, and it's not safe. And that's not a popular decision. And it doesn't comport with the world's values. And our, we want for our kids that they will be happy and that they will be successful, that they will enjoy personal peace and affluence. And being a missionary in Africa isn't those things. So they try to discourage, even though it's a divine call on a life, Sometimes these temptations, these trials, these tests come to us. Jesus experienced that. Mark chapter 3. He left the carpenter shop. He left his family. He became an itinerant minister. He's wandering around in Galilee teaching and preaching and doing ministry. And his family thinks he's a nutter. He's a nut job. We've got to go get, uh, put him in a straitjacket and drag him back home. Mary's thinking, where am I going to get my grandkids from? James is ticked because he's the next in line. And somebody's got to run the carpenter shop, and Jesus has walked off the job. James is a Pharisee. He wants to be a religious scholar. He doesn't want to work in the carpenter shop. Jesus, get your butt back home. And so in 321, they came to, by force, wrap him up and take him back home again. Jesus has experienced these things. Temptations come to us from outside of ourselves, but they also come to us from within ourselves. Each one of us has a besetting sin. There's a catalog of sins, and I can show you several in the New Testament. And each one of us has a specialty. It's a chink in our armor. It's an Achilles heel. It's the weak spot. When you pass this thing by, it's a violent temptation. Hershey's Kisses, I don't know what it is. And you got to have it. And then somebody else just walks by, and it's not even a thing that's on their radar screen. Why are you attracted to that? Why is that an issue? And we're all different. Each one of us has this weakness, has this Achilles heel that is attractive to us. And that's something that's within each one of us. Each one of those things is different for each one of us. And then our strength. Our what? Our strength within us. There's things that we're good at. Charlie would have said when we were in our 20s, I'll never leave Lydia, I'll never leave my kids. Be careful, because overconfidence is a prelude to destruction. The, the writer of Proverbs, pride cometh before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. At the turn of the last century, everyone in the world was enamored with our new technology and our new science. It's going to usher in the kingdom of God. They were post-millennial. Things are going to be awesome because we figured all this stuff out. And so um, they released, they built the hull for the Titanic, and they rolled it out. And it had these cutting edge technology, electronic, watertight doors. And the newspaper in Belfast said, this ship will never sink because of all of the safety precautions. 
There was a passenger who had never been on a ship before and was afraid to get on the ship, and a purser at the dock getting on to the Titanic said to her, honey, you don't have a thing in the world to worry about. God himself couldn't sink this ship. You all know how that story turned out. So, your strength can also be your weakness, and you can be led into temptation. Remember, but for the grace of God, there go any one of us. Two more considerations before we quit. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're also praying, God, don't answer our prayers. Because sometimes we pray for things that we shouldn't have. We, good things, bad things, it doesn't matter. Imagine, I'm a safe cracker, oh God, Give skill to my digits as I break into this safe. You think God's going to answer that prayer? I knew a couple that were dating in college, and they were Christians, and they were fornicating, and every time they would go to have sex, they would pray, and God, don't let her get pregnant. God doesn't answer those prayers. Guess who got pregnant? And guess who they were mad at? God. Well, there is no God, because he didn't answer our prayers. Really? And so they stopped walking with the Lord because, well, clearly there's no God. We prayed, God, let me do this sin, but keep me from the consequences. God, let me do this sin, but don't let me get caught. Seriously? And yet they were in earnest. They, they really believed that, that this God should do this for them. Um, we can pray for things that, that we think would be good for us. It's up to $320 million. Oh, Lord, let me win the lottery. Let me tell you about this guy, William Post. He won the Pennsylvania Lottery in 1988. He won the big one for the state lottery, $16.2 million. And he was interviewed by the paper a couple of years later. And uh, they asked him about the experience. Oh, gosh, it was awful. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. I had the American dream, and then I lost it. I, I, it was a mighty fall. It's called hitting rock bottom. I never learned a simple sentence in the English language. No is a complete sentence with a period at the end. Everybody I knew and people I didn't know came with their hand out. Everybody wanted a piece of my money. His girlfriend at the time successfully sued for a portion of his winnings, so he lost those. His brother, I'm not making this up, hired a hitman to whack him so that he could get his hands on some of that money from the lottery. Within a year, $16.2 million, he was a million dollars in debt, and he went to jail because a bill collector kept hounding him at his house, and he came out with a shotgun and fired a shot over his head, and he went to jail for that. Now he lives in a trailer on $450 a month Social Security and food stamps. And he's much happier now than when he had won the lottery. And he's not alone. I mean, if you read stories about what happens to the lottery winners, it's a cautionary tale. This, is, this happens more often than we think. God loves us enough to keep us from things that we think would be good for us. Oh, I'll tithe it, and I'll give it to the church, and, and I'll do this, and I'll do that. Well, that doesn't always happen. One final point. We can have confidence when we experience, when we pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation. We can have confidence that God hears us. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. I'm not faithful. You're not faithful. But God is faithful, and he won't allow you to be tried, tested, tempted, beyond your ability to endure it. He won't allow that. But with the temptation, with the test, he will provide for you a way of escape along with it. So you get dropped off at the house of the rising sun, the house of temptation. You don't have to go in there. God has provided a way of escape. You're in a room and you're tempted and the devil's by the door. You don't have to go there. You can go out the window. You can go out the back door. But he will provide for you a way of escape in order that you might be able to endure it. He is faithful. Again, these trials, these tests, are not designed to get us to sin. They're designed so that we can become stronger and better able to stand against sin in our lives. And Jesus taught his disciples, lead us not into temptation. Amen.